Welcome to World of DAS, a show for data enthusiasts. I'm your host, Warren Hoffman, CEO of SafeGraph. For more conversations, videos, and transcripts, visit safegraph.com slash podcasts. Hello, fellow data nerds. My guest today is Richard Haas. Richard is the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, and he previously served as director of policy planning at the U.S. State Department. And he was President George W. Bush's special envoy to Northern Ireland and the coordinator for the future of Afghanistan. He's also the author of 14 books, most recently, The World, A Brief Introduction. Richard, welcome to World of Dats. Thank you, Warren, but I should just make clear, I, I, am, I am many things, but I am not a data nerd. So uh, it's very, it's either a big mistake that you have me here or very generous. Of well, this is the, this is the union between foreign policy nerds and data nerds. So we're getting together. I really want to dive in. You and I over the years have had, we agree on a bunch of things, but we also disagree on a bunch of things. And I thought it'd be fun to just hash out some of those disagreements. Bunch is bigger. Art. Well, okay. One, one area that we, you and I have disagreed with for, gosh, for the last decade is just the value of the speech. Um, and um, we've had this kind of ongoing debate of how valuable like things like speeches and lectures are. Um, and while you know, while we maybe both believe like the value of a speech has been declining over the last hundred years, I think you still believe they're they're super valuable. Why don't you give your argument? We can kind of hash out a little bit. <laughs> Well, as someone who gives a lot of speeches, I've got a real self-interest in their, <laughs> in their being uh, valuable. Otherwise, the quality of my life is going to deteriorate. Uh, also, I look at history, and I don't, you might say this proves your point, but I think speeches can be a great way of educating. So FDR, in the run-up to what became World War II, his use of not just speeches, but his addresses over the radio, his fireside chats, were remarkably uh, important. And I actually think contemporary presidents, and that includes this one, the previous one, even Barack Obama, who was a gifted speaker, don't do it enough. I actually think it is a way to connect. And often you've got to return to subjects and explain. But speeches, whether it's 20 minutes, 25 minutes, hopefully with memorable lines, you know, we think of inaugural speeches, sometimes farewell addresses, major presidential, I think can have a real impact. Take some of the most famous that, and for people who weren't presidents, some of you know, Steve Jobs, the speech by Admiral McRaven at the University of Texas, the, what became the Make My Bed uh, advice to uh, graduate Barbara Bush's talk to Wellesley. I actually think speeches can have real staying power, uh, in part because people tend to put a lot of work into them. And you're thinking when you do them, when you prepare and give a speech, you're trying to connect with an audience. So it's hard, but my own view is every now and then you get you get a connection that really endures. It, it does seem that that every now and then there's a great speech, but it just seems like the average quality has is going down dramatically. I, I don't know if you agree with that or not. I mean, I can't remember the last time there was this great inaugural address or, you know, even from a president, which is so much or the, a great speech to Congress or something like that. Uh, it, it happens. It happens occasionally, but it, but it seems more rare today than than it, you, you don't see the Gettysburg Address or the Ask Not what what your country can do for you anymore. Well, you never saw a lot of them to begin with. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> Look, and again, they're hard. It's hard to do a good speech. It takes a lot of work, and not everybody has the gift in the writing and the words. Few people have the gift in the delivery. But I still think you know when I used to, uh, Bill Sapphire who was the former columnist of the New York Times, was a really gifted uh, speechwriter. And he, he wrote for Nixon and for other presidents or uh, uh, and published various books of the great speeches of history. I think of somebody like Peggy Noonan, one of his more contemporary you know, equivalents. Uh, so I still think there's a place for it. And I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's frequent. And maybe because it's hard and infrequent is what makes a good speech potentially so important because it has stickiness. I think good speeches can have a degree of uh, traction that you know, tweets are simply not going to have. Let's dive into the foreign policy establishment, quote unquote. Um, I think your view is that while the, the foreign policy establishment maybe has made some big blunders over the last 20 years, it's been broadly correct. Whereas maybe my view has been while the foreign policy establishment has got some big things right over the last 20 years, it's been broadly incorrect. Why, why am I wrong? Over the last 20 years, you may not be wrong. I actually think 
Uh, I hope you're sitting down. I know that's shocking. <laughs> I, I am about to be shocked here. Yes, this is going to make news. <laughs> Look, I, I recently wrote a piece for our magazine, Foreign Affairs. And I said, if there was a word to describe American foreign policy, I can't remember, I said over the last 20 or 30 years, 30 years being the end of the Cold War, 20 years being since 9-11, the, the word that would fit would be squander. The United States emerged from the Cold War with a degree of absolute as well as relative power that really had very few precedents. Interestingly enough, one of those precedents was the United States after World War II, when we emerged with extraordinary absolute and relative uh, power. But there we had a lot of show for it. You think about it, the alliance systems in Europe, in Asia, the entire UN system, the IMF, the World Bank, the forerunner of the W. We built institutions. We built institutions and we had an enormous payoff, which was the enormous uh, economic development of the world. Countries that had been colonies became independent states, democracy prospered. Uh, economies grew, lifespans uh, were, were uh, extended. And the last I checked, the Cold War stayed cold in terms of U.S.-Soviet relations. And it ended, on, ended peacefully and on terms that were almost uh, overwhelmingly ours. That, uh, look, in the, the analogy I sometimes draw is, you know, the Truman Secretary of State, uh, second sec- Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, immodestly but perhaps fairly titled his memoirs present at the creation. It was an extraordinary era of statecraft. I look at the last 20, 30 years, I'm sorry to say there's very little creation. There were some things, uh, NAFTA, uh, which is much criticized, but I think mostly unfairly, PEPFARS, which did save so many lives, particularly in Africa, the Millennium Challenge uh, account, which is a whole new approach to foreign aid. Some of the uh, reforms after 9-11 were arguably uh, desirable, I think, in the, and so forth. But If you're asking me in the large, do we have a lot to show for the last 30 years? God, no. We squandered an enormous amount of our human and economic and military resources and capital and lives in the greater Middle East. We were way too ambitious in trying to transform countries in a region that was not ripe for uh, transformation. We didn't do enough, enough in other parts of the world. We certainly didn't do enough at home to improve the quality of, of life in the, uh, in the United States. So I think historians will scratch their heads and will be brutally critical. Where does the blame lie? The people, the John McCloys, the Dean Atchison's of that era were, were better than the people of, the, of, the, of this era? Or, you know, why have we squandered all of this? It's, it's a good question. I think that you could look at some of the people. That was an extraordinary gaggle of people from Atchison to Marshall to Kennan to Truman. You know, you don't get that kind of a constellation. But when I look and say the people around the 41st president, full disclosure, I work with them. But I look at Bush himself. I look at uh, Baker. Powell, who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Jim Baker, who was secretary of state, Brent Scowcroft, who was national security advisor, Bob Gates, who was his deputy. That's, that's a pretty impressive team by any and every uh, measure. I think they were focused, though, more on ending the Cold War peacefully, dealing with the Iraqi aggression. In the, in the Gulf uh, in 1990. The subsequent, I think, five presidents from Clinton through George W. Bush, Obama, Trump, and uh, Clinton's was kind of a foreign policy that was really drifted. There were no major undertakings other than perhaps NATO enlargement. And I think that's a questionable desirability. Uh, Bush, I think, overreached. Bush the son, 43, in terms of his transformation agenda. I think it was a real misuse of what we were, uh, of our capabilities, a real misreading of the world about what it is we could reasonably uh, accomplish. And the next three presidents, uh, Obama, Trump, and Biden, were to one extent or another, more and much more in common than one would realize, were reactions to Bush 43 and essentially said he overreached, we're going to underreach. Or were very similar to maybe the second term of Bush 43 rather than the first term of Bush 43 or something. And so, exactly. So they were going to, so they pulled back. And so they were almost like the cat that sat on the hot stove. They weren't going to sit on the stove. Anymore. So Bush, I think history will say Bush 43, his errors were more of commission. I think his successors, they'll say, were more errors of, of omission. And as a result, you know, we've turned inward. We don't have new institutions or where we have new institutions like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now the CPTP, we don't join them. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, again, I think it's a, a real mistake in terms of uh, what we, and what's so ironic. I'll stop after 30 more seconds. 
is this is happening at a time. I mean, think about it with COVID. We're living with and dying from this, this virus that developed, grew up one way or another and broke out in China. You've got that. You've got climate change. Every day, we are seeing the manifestations of globalization. That even if your goal is to, quote unquote, build back better here, even if you're thinking it's America first, the lesson ought to be we will only succeed here at home if we succeed abroad. And I just don't see that message uh, internalized. Okay, well, that, that, that may be another disagreement that I think we could disagree on, but, but maybe it may be wrong there, uh, which is kind of this world coordination. There's one opinion that maybe that I think you hold, but I could be wrong, um, that we need more global coordination and cooperation to solve these big problems. And then there's kind of an alternate agreement, which is the cost of getting this cooperation is super high, and we should instead focus more on self-reliance. That's, but self-reliance is nonsense for the most part, in a global era. You can't be self-reliant on climate change. You can't be self-reliant on infectious disease. You can make supply chains slightly more uh, resilient, but you can't become economically autarkic or, or, or self-reliant. Cyberspace, where we were talking about, you can't yourself set or enforce the rules. So the idea that we are going to be self-reliant or largely unilateral in a global era is really, it's just nonsense. Sorry. It's just good. There's no reason. No, the real question is, what is it you try to achieve in the world and how do you achieve it? You're not going to get all 192 or three countries to sign up. So to me, the interesting question is, what are your goals and how do you fashion coalitions to bring you closer to them? And that, that's a serious uh, foreign policy challenge. One thing that might be a disagreement, but may not as well, is um, maybe there's a Silicon Valley versus DC divide, which is you know, in some ways, like the DC kind of focus is focus on fixing broken things um, and trying to trying to figure out how to fix these things that are broken. And then the Silicon Valley view might be like, okay, we need to create new things to, to, to a better world. We need to create new technologies, right? And it seems most of, let's say, foreign policy military is kind of more, more fixated on these broken things. Whereas these more like innovation is focused on like making things great. Like, how do you see these, this kind of tension? It's interesting. I never, I don't know if I agree or disagree because I never thought of it in quite those terms. And I don't see why it's a choice or a tension. If you think of climate change, you could think of it in like two ways, right? One is um, we're going to build things. Um, that are going to create great stuff. And, and then the other one is that we're going to reduce emissions, right? And, and probably like 98% of the conversation is on reduced emissions and a very small percentage is on the, you know, the other side of it. Well, look, but you could say you want to reduce emissions. One of the ways you reduce emissions uh, me, uh, would be it of methane or carbon dioxide is by green technologies. So there the two go hand in hand. Uh, other places, technology or fixing broken things, adaptation. Uh, how do we make society, cities more resilient? I would say that's to some extent fixing broken things. Geoengineering. If and when, and I think unfortunately when, mitigation comes up short and global warming or climate change continues, we're already up a degree Celsius, we'll go up another half a degree no matter what. We'll just say we go up a couple of degrees. Then I think geoengineering and some sort of efforts to uh, you know, filter out some sunlight, cool the earth. I think that's an example where the only way to fix a broken thing, in that case, in some ways, the planet Earth and the water and the atmosphere, is to do something dramatic through technology. So my guess is these are going to go hand in hand. Uh, I don't see attention. I see them more complementary. It sounds like you're drinking the Silicon Valley Kool-Aid as well. So this is uh, this is a surprise, which is good. It's even bigger surprise to me. Lawrence. I've been <laughs> accused of many things, but drinking Silicon Valley Kool-Aid. That's the first, my friend. Yeah, all right. Well, we don't we don't pull punches on the world of death. You know, one of the things about like this can I, idea. Can I interrupt for a second? Yeah. Anyone who spent time in Washington, DAS is a very confusing thing. A DAS in Washington is a deputy assistant secretary. So, <laughs> Where we plot our audience geographically, we have like zero people in DC, probably because they don't want to hear from deputy assistant secretaries. You know? Why should I bother hearing from somebody at that level? There's this view, you know, maybe popularized by like people like Peter Zeon and stuff that America was has been becoming isolationist for a long time, is becoming isolationist well before 2016. And it will kind of like inevitably continue on that path because, uh, you know, it, people like him believe that America has less to gain from integration than, than most other countries. Like, whereas like a country like China may have more to gain. Like, how do you think about 
where America should be focused on engagement and maybe where like, you know, because of the population may not care as much, et cetera, where we should be less focused on it. Isolationism to me is, is not a serious option for the United States. Again, globalization is a reality. You may not like climate change. You may not like people interfering with you through cyberspace. You might not like the fact that in a couple of years, if not sooner, North Korean missiles will be able to reach us carrying nuclear uh, warheads. You might like, not like the fact that disease can break out in Wuhan and reach here. Uh, we just marked the 20th anniversary of 9-11 or the terrorists can get on airplanes and fly them into buildings. That's a reality. And isolationism is not gonna erect barriers to those kinds of threats. So to argue for isolationism, you're, you're literally putting your head in the sand and the ocean's gonna come over you. So that to me is not a serious option for the United States. Now, the flip side of that is not to argue for indiscriminate internationalism. That, that's nutty. I mean, overreach, we're not gonna make the rest of the world democratic anytime soon. I don't think that ought to be our principle. Even in 2016, we had like a former secretary of state running for president and even she wouldn't endorse TPP, right? So it seems like there's the there's a population that is moving much more isolationist that we have to grapple with. hundred percent. Right? Yeah, it's both protectionist and, and isolate and more inward looking. Uh, I think trade, which has been a real engine of economic growth, and it's been a real uh, it's been a real source of uh, strengthening alliances. Now, if we were part of what's called CPTPP in Asia, that's the best mechanism I know for reining in certain Chinese economic behaviors we don't like. So I find it stunning when people rail against trade and then rail against Chinese economic practices. It's like, hey, pay attention. You just <laughs> forfeited the biggest tool. Also, people talk about climate change for good reason. Well, one of the ways we could do a hell of a lot more about climate change than anything that's going to be accomplished in Glasgow or Paris would be through trade agreements. We can introduce cross-border carbon taxes. So, yeah, we're isolationist in some ways and we're protectionist in particular in, in others, but we shouldn't think that in many cases it adds up. So again, I'm not advocating for a foreign policy of the United States that tries to make the entire world democratic. Not that I'd mind that. I'm not arguing for a foreign policy that uses military force anywhere and everywhere, but the much greater danger facing the United States now and for the foreseeable future is we do too little that we do too little in the world and these global problems really come and hit us hard. And if you're not worried about that, you're not paying attention. One thing I wanted to ask you about was companies and their own foreign policy, especially tech companies like Google and Apple, they're, they're, they act a little bit like countries. Like if a CEO visits another country, it's like it's almost like treated like a head of state visit. Um, and while these are American companies, they sometimes um, have a foreign policy that could come in conflict with that of, of the nation. Like, how do you see this tension evolving? I think your point's entirely accurate. In some cases, they're more important than countries. If you look at the UN General Assembly, 190 plus countries, I would say you know, Alphabet and Facebook and a few of the others, uh, Apple, are objectively more important. They've got greater access to resources. They're bigger change agents in the, in, in, in the world. And if you're trying to come back to the conversation we had some minutes ago about regulating cyberspace, how are you going to have that conversation if the representatives of some of these big companies are not sitting around the table? I was once invited in by the sec a previous secretary general of the UN to discuss global health management. And I said, I'll do it, but only if you have people from things, places like the Gates Foundation and Big Pharma around the table. They're at least as important as, as anything the World Health Organization might get up to, not to mention the Minister of Health and this or that uh, country. So I, I see these big corporations as important players, to use the cliche, the chessboard has pieces that are more than countries. And it's Eldridge Cleaver, who I'm sure you've had on your show in the past, uh, might have said, they're either going to be part of the solution or part of the problem. We've got to bring them in. Well, so if it's health, you can't do it without biotech companies or farmer. Uh, if it's refugee issues, how are you going to do it without NGOs? And if it's technology questions, you can't do it without the big tech companies. And if I were running one of those companies, uh, if I were advising one, uh, yeah, you want foreign policy. You want a domestic policy too. You want to know how to deal with our government. 
and you want to basically try to influence the policies of the EU or or other either individual governments or collections of governments. But yeah, you want to you you need to be a participant and rather than simply an observer of what goes on of, of what goes on in the world. All right, well, since this is a data podcast, I have to ask you about some data. And you know, data is now seeping in a lot to these like policy decisions. I know, like personally with SafeGraph, like we work with like the transportation department and different health departments and the Federal Reserve, and and they they become like way, way, way better at using data today than than these organizations were just a few years ago. How has using data in foreign policy changed over time? Uh, so let me say, you know. Full disclosure, I've not been in government now for 18 years. I mean, I've worked for four presidents at the Pentagon, the State Department, and the White House. Uh, but uh, I've been out of government for 18 years. As an outsider, though, I've, I've worked with some companies that are rich in data um, that have advised the government. And I would say their biggest has been less in foreign policy, more with the Defense Department and other and the intelligence community people doing massive responses to crises, uh, but not so much to -to day-to-day diplomacy. Uh, So I don't think the State Department in its diplomacy mission is a great user of the kind of data you're... Why not? Like, it seems like a data science organization within the State Department could do a lot of good. How so? I'm curious. I'm like, what what, what do you think? If you're Tony Blinken, I mean, all the data in the world wouldn't help you... Uh, do a better job of consulting with the French before you, you know, tell Australia to uh, you know, buy American submarines. That's not a data challenge. In some cases, you're right, where these are people challenges and stuff. But understanding like the big trends of the world, the big macro trends, understanding what's happening, et cetera, does seem like, you know, if you're if you're doing some large planning exercise, it could be really helpful. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't notice that. At that level, absolutely. Whether you're thinking about climate issues, demographic issues, take we're Yep. Demography. That's a great, great example. Yeah. And I don't see how you could think about the evol- the trajectory of China. It's going to get older, its population shrinking and so forth. You've got all sorts of health issues, obviously debt issues. You need di- data to understand what are the constraints that China is and will be operating under or Russia uh, the same way. So I agree. I mean, uh, I see that in some ways as an intelligence or anal- it's a necessary yeah. for analysis, which is a necessary input to uh, policy making. I was thinking of data slightly more in a tactical or operational sense. What you're suggesting is in an intellectual analytical sense, 100 percent. I don't see how you look. Uh, I lead a think tank and virtually everything we do is informed by 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 data. I don't see how you can have informed views of either functional issues in the world or countries and so forth. Without understanding, uh, without understanding data, it's 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 a necessary what ingredient or raw material to any analysis, and the analysis is obviously then a precursor to prescription. What do you see as like the big global issues that are not getting enough attention? I expect I may surprise you. I'd say climate change in one sense. Climate change has the problem of being a slow motion crisis, and it's been with us for a while. It's almost too familiar. And there's, this, there's, there's not enough urgency. One of the problems, no pun intended, of a slowly melting ice cube is you don't pay that much attention to it. And climate change has a little bit of that. So I actually think it's a global problem where the response is so inadequate. So yeah, it gets talked about, but there's not, a, not nearly as much activity as there needs to be in the global institutional arrangements or woefully. And do you think the, resp- the response is inadequate because people, act, they say they believe it, but they don't really believe it? Or do you think of the sponsors re- because they feel like they'll have time to react to it? If it's such a big problem, why do you think the response has been so inadequate? With the exception of the previous American administration, it's largely the latter. It's what in the business literature, you have a lot of reference to the urgent driving out the important. Climate change has for a long time been seen as important, but tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. And it hasn't received or been seen through a lens of sufficient urgency. It turns out climate change is both important and urgent. And I don't think people have twigged. I hope that were to happen soon. Because it does seem like on, on the climate change, like almost everything is about uh, we have to reduce emissions somehow. And it's it's a it's kind of this punitive thing. It's, you mentioned things like geoengineering or some sort of like big carbon capture. These are very reasonable things to to put some money behind. But it doesn't seem like, you know, I, I haven't heard 
um, any any climate change person really, really per, being a proponent of putting money behind some of these bigger initiatives like a Manhattan Project for those things? One of the reasons is, it's, it's kind of interesting, is because I often talk about these things and then I get accused of uh, not being serious about mitigation, uh, that somehow if you support geoengineering or carbon capture or too much on adaptation, too many people are quick to accuse you of not being willing to get really serious on mitigation. And my view is, no, I'm prepared to get serious about mitigation, but I'm, I'm not optimistic that the world will ever get to the point. So we better have plan B and plan C and plan D or, or complements to a mitigation strategy. There's no scenario where the world is a negative emitter. It's always going to be a positive emitter, right? So therefore, it should get worse over time unless there's something bigger that people can, can, are, are willing to do about it. Even if tomorrow we became a, non, a net non-emitter, we reached zero carbon output, we're still going up another half a degree Celsius. Correct. Because that's baked into the cake. And, and even getting a net zero is, is pie in the sky thinking like it's not going to happen, right? It ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. So as a result, I don't mind saying how do we get more ambitious and more successful on stopping emissions, but I think it's irresponsible not to look at the other necessary components of a policy from adaptation to things like carbon capture and, and geoengineering. It's not one or the other. I think it's one and the other. So why do you think that you know, probably 90 plus percent of people who care about climate change are in your estimation irresponsible? <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> it's not irresponsible to worry about emissions. It's, indeed, it's irresponsible not to worry about emissions, not to support mitigation. What I think is wildly unrealistic to think is that a mitigation strategy alone will ever be sufficient. Yeah, but it, 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 it's, it's not only unrealistic, it's obviously wrong, right? There's some sort of cognitive dissonance that they, they argue for where they know it's not going, like if you just ask them, they'll tell you it's not going to work. I know, but I told you, I think there is a concern, which I think is misplaced, that if you take the pressure off doing more on mitigation and you start talking about other tools or other approaches, they are worried that what little chance there is of making real progress on mitigation will, will go away. So they, they see it, I think, uh, largely in those terms. I'll be honest with you, a lot of them are also quite critical of geoengineering, either the science, they're worried about the unknowns, and second of all, the governance issues, who decides what can be done and where. So you know, a lot of these things, again, there's there's no panaceas here. There's no yeah. solutions. Uh, I'm just, I just use that as an example. What's so interesting about climate change, because you asked me what issue doesn't get enough attention or, or talked about, I can't remember the exact wording is, climate change is talked about a lot, but there's not, a, not nearly as much that's actually being done about it. And I could say that for what it's worth about every other global challenge, global health. The world machinery is woefully inadequate. We're, we've seen we've seen that proliferation. Look, we've got North Korea is churning out more and more nuclear weapons and missiles. Iran is is essentially on the verge of becoming what I would call a threshold or near nuclear weapons country. Cyber we talked about before. There's very little in the way of what political scientists call a regime to regulate uh, behavior. Uh, in that in that era. So what I think we, we, we're we living in is an era where global challenges are so prevalent and so so large. It's what makes this hip era of history somewhat different. We have all the old geopolitical challenges. I get that. It's the familiar stuff of history. But now we've got these global challenges almost layered on, on top of them. And our responses are are seriously inadequate and even worse the gap between where we are and where we need to be may be growing. How do you see possible scenarios of realignment happening over the next decade? If you think of the, like, let's say the past 25 years, like you've seen like countries like the U.S. and India get much, much closer together, or the U.S. and Vietnam get closer together, or, you know, these things that maybe you wouldn't have thought were possible in the, in the 90s. What's something that could happen in 10 years that is maybe uh, a, a less likely today? It's an interesting question. I would think we're probably seeing the early stages of at least two changes. One is a certain greater distancing between the United States and Europe, that I think the transatlantic bonds become less tight or close uh, 
and I think the United States is building more bonds to certain countries in the Asia Pacific or what's now called the Indo-Pacific, largely out of concern, a shared concern about uh, China. So I think those are probably the two big strategic trends. I think the two big question marks, well, not just two, I think the, the biggest question marks in the world, though, are maybe internal developments in three countries. Let me just give you my three. One will be uh, Russia. Uh, Mr. Putin has effectively deinstitutionalized the country. He's now said he wants to remain in power for another 15 years till 2036. Does he make it? What happens then? You know, Bob Gates always says the only way Vladimir pa Putin will ever leave power is feet first. Okay, well, what happens to Russia that day? What does the struggle for power look like? What happens to Russia? Because the country now has no institutions. He's run a kleptocracy. So what happens? And this is a country of what, 140, 145 million people, significant energy resources, military, nuclear weapons. What comes of it? I think that's a big question. China, everyone sort of projects China's rise. Well, we just ran a piece in our magazine, Foreign Affairs, which basically is the title was The End of China's Rise, and essentially saying, how would I put it, that peak China is, be, is behind us. China is now on a different trajectory. Many more problems caused, to, caused by environmental degradation, public health issues, demographic issues, the unintended consequences of the one-child policy, too much centralized political leadership, too much debt. We could go on. And simply saying that, uh, what happens there? Xi Jinping has abolished term limits. So what, what now happens? What is China's? What does succession look like after Xi Jinping, whenever it happens? And how smoothly does it go? What, what's the next phase? China. And then I think the other big question is us. After January 6th, given you know, all the challenges to American democracy from social media to the quote unquote big lie about fraudulent elections, which in fact were not fraudulent, a uh, growing, uh, growing number of Americans not valuing democracy, willing to use force to advance their political beliefs. What does the United States look like in 10 or 20 years? So here are three, arguably, of the most consequential countries in the world. And I don't think any one of us or anyone can basically state with confidence what any of these three countries is going to look like in a decade or two decades. As a result, that might be the single most significant development in the world. It might not be relations between countries or developments between countries, but rather developments within countries. Maybe some of the worst performing investments in U.S. history, maybe like the war in Afghanistan or something like that. But if you think of the opposite side, like the best performing investments in U.S. history, you, you have to put like the Louisiana Purchase, the Alaska Purchase, like some of these things have, have been incredibly, like the ROI on these things have been just off the charts. Why is some sort of territorial purchase completely um, it seems like off the table, like why, like if you think of Greenland, Greenland has 56,000 people. If we purchased it for $56 billion, we'd give each person a million dollars. It would be the richest uh, piece of, uh, it'd be the richest territory in the world on a per capita basis. 56 billion for, for Greenland is probably a steal. Uh, they have the right to self-determination. They, they probably would vote for it. Like, why can't we do those types of things? Like, why are some of those things completely off the table? In order for there to be a uh, transfer, shall we say, there has to be a willing buyer and a willing seller. Uh, it's not clear to me you've got a willing seller, but let me make a let me challenge your your thesis. The United States could acquire if we were to acquire Greenland. I don't think that would. That's not going to determine our future. I actually think that's in somewhere tertiary or whatever. Yeah. I don't know what the level is after tertiary. My. I'm not sure well, you know, my Greek or math isn't good enough. If climate change happens, it's probably a much more important place than before. And the Arctic becomes much more important and ceilings there become more important. And you have all these other things that could be valuable. But it's not going to be a substitute and for sure. what we now have. And I'm much more worried about our democracy functioning. I mean, again, I, uh, I don't think we ought to be looking abroad for kind of shortcuts or the kind of thing you're suggesting, almost out of the box developments. I'm much more worried about uh, some of the trends that are underway or things that we're not doing that we could and should be doing with some of the tools we now know about climate change uh, or dealing with global health issues. I mean, again, I'm also more worried about negatives. I'm worried that some terrorist is going to wake up in the morning and, it's gonna, and looks at COVID and goes, oh, I've been wasting my time thinking about car bombs and flying airplanes into buildings. I ought to be thinking about biotech. So I, I think we ought to, you know, I would say we ought to be looking at things. How do we make ourselves more resilient? But I, I wouldn't spend a lot of my time 
thinking about, if you will, the Greenlands out there. Okay. All right. That's fair. That's fair. All right. I'm probably drinking the Silicon Valley Kool-Aid a little bit too much. One of the things I admire about you is that you, you do consistently seek out people who disagree with you. Um, and rather than like always jumping into echo chambers, um, what in your background kind of like made you that way? You want, you're asking why, why do you and I get along? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's just interesting. Uh, yeah. And I love it. You know, I'm older than you. I love it when I, I have those moments where I learn and I, didn't, I, I get to think about something in a way I'd never thought about it before. It's one of the reasons, by the way, I like spending some time with some of these startups that are in the technology space. It's not just everybody's half my age. Look, I grew up in a house where I remember every day there was dinner conversation. And you were expected to show up at dinner. And, you know, by then I had done whatever sport I had done or whatever homework I was supposed to do or not do. But dinner conversation was important. So I grew up in a world of a certain degree of debate, that kind of intellectual exchange. So I'm just comfortable. I'm just comfortable with it. And I I love it when I I get in conversations. To me, conversations are a chance to learn and, and one way or another, test your arguments, strengthen them, maybe reject them for something better. My ego is not caught up in that. I, I actually like it when I, I get persuaded uh, by one of my kids or one of my colleagues or, or uh, my wife or whomever. Like her three favorite words in the English language, you were right. <laughs> <laughs> so from her point of view, I can't, I can't you know, articulate them enough. But I just like the, the give and take, particularly for people who come at it from, you know, my background is much more historical. Others may come at it more technological or whatever. And that, that, that's fun. All right. You, you've worked for, I think, four presidents. Uh, this may be a very unfair question. You can pass if you want. But is there, is there one of those four that you most admire? There is. I worked for Jimmy Carter. Uh, I was a fairly modest level person at the Pentagon. I worked for Ronald Reagan when I was at the State Department. Uh, and then I worked for George Bush, the father, George H.W. Bush at the White House, where I was the main Middle East, South Asia advisor on the National Security Council. Then I worked for um, George W. Bush at the State Department, where I ran the policy planning staff. I was closest to George Bush, the father, to 41. And I just think he was one of the great foreign policy presidents of American, uh, of, of, the, of modern United States. Uh, he had a great bunch of people around him. Uh, personally, I respected him and, and liked him, his values, the tone he set in the uh, administration. And I thought it was uh, there was a, um, a commitment to process and to conversation. And you, it was an environment where you could challenge orthodoxy. And you, kind of, I always, I didn't always win the argument, but I always had a chance. And you can't ask for more than. Uh, that and I, I also think he was the most successful. I would say the two most successful foreign policy presidents the United States had in the modern era are Harry Truman and, and George Herbert Walker Bush. And one was at the dawn of the Cold War, the other was the other bookend at the end of the Cold War. And I think the fact that, again, the Cold War ultimately began uh, and ended the way it did was because of these two gentlemen. Do you think the world would be substantially different if George H.W. Bush won a second term? One of the biggest what ifs in my life. And Brent Scowcroft, who was one of my dearest friends and was my boss for those four years. And I have talked to, had we talked about that a lot, what we might have done with the second term. Uh, so the answer is, yeah, I do. I think there were things we both could have done and could have avoided in a second term. We thought we had some chances to advance peace prospects in the Middle East, particularly working with Itzhak Rabin. Now, his assassination, I think, really had a, a significant effect on uh, the arc of Middle Eastern history involving Israelis and uh, Palestinians. Uh, I think we could have done some other things in terms of U.S.-Chinese relations, U.S.-Russian uh, relations that might have been uh, more productive. Now, I don't know. You, know you, can, you can't roll history back and you can't say if we had done this or not done that, things would have turned out uh, better. But yeah, we had talked a lot about what we might might have done with a second term. And I, what's what's interesting to me about the Clinton administration, its first term would, have, in a sense, that was the same time period that would have been Bush's second term. Foreign policy was not a big priority, and there was some interest in. And even when it was, it was it was it was. I think they would even admit it was quite chaotic. 
it was chaotic in the places like Somalia, where they overreached, and Haiti. Uh, and then the big initiative was NATO enlargement, which I have doubts about the, the wisdom of having done that. I thought there were other ways we could have uh, assured the security of um, parts of the former Soviet Union and, and as well as uh, other countries. But so, yeah, I think, uh, uh, look, it's one of those, you know, you'll never know, but it, it is for me both fun, but also frustrating to think about what a second term um, might have brought. All right. Last question we ask all of our guests, what is the conventional wisdom or advice? It could be for business, it could be foreign policy, it could be personal. That is generally bad advice. For younger people who constantly ask, I, my, my thing is to think you need to know what you want to do. I think too many people get totally stuck and stressed over the need for a plan and to know what your next step is going to be. Uh, as you said, I'm several times older than probably a lot of people listening to this. I think there's, um, I think people get way too stuck on uh, on planning and putting pressure for themselves. I'm a great believer in, in sort of, you know, experimenting. I do think there's something, it's, it's fine to figure out what's not, right for you. I think the biggest mistake analytically people make is they they spend way too much criticizing options and not nearly enough time criticizing not doing things. They're much tougher on uh, acts of commission often than they are on acts of omission. Sticking with what you've got or doing nothing doesn't tends not to get the ri- the degree of uh, analytical rigor of potentially of 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 of, ch- of changing speed or direction and as a result particularly in government there's often a bias towards not changing. That is uh, that is unfortunate because it doesn't, again, receive the the questioning and rigor that it uh, needs to. I'd say one last thing now that I'm, th- I'm answering, I'm thinking of my answer to your question. The biggest single thing I'd probably tell everybody in any line of work is to question your assumptions. I think assumptions are really dangerous things. I was involved in a deeply flawed one, which was terrible, which was the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And for example, when Saddam wouldn't let the inspectors in, people like me said, ah, that proves he's got something to hide. Actually, what it proved is the opposite, that he didn't have something, but he wanted to hide the fact he didn't have it. That's just a really powerful example of how assumptions can drive things. This administration, the Biden administration, made certain assumptions about how things were going to unfold in Afghanistan, and they weren't prepared for when things unfolded in a far messier, far faster way. So I would say the now about assumptions, you know, about democracy, I would just say anything and everything. I'd first identify your assumptions, whether you're in business or your personal life or your government diplomacy, and then really ask yourself how confident ought you to be about those? And what happens if for whatever reason you're wrong? To what extent are, is, is either your, are your, is your analysis or your plan of action contingent on your assumption being accurate? And on the and if you're not, then what do you what what had you better be prepared for? So my yeah, my advice now that I stalled for a minute or two would be uh, unpack, identify your assumptions, get some sense of how confident you ought to be in them, and prepare for the possibility they may not be accurate. But people don't like to question their worldview. They, they their their identity is wrapped up often in these assumptions, like. Once you start questioning them, they may have to change who they are. If you, if you go back to like some of the climate change discussion we had earlier, like how does how does one do that in a way where they they still can feel good about their identity? I think people have to separate their identity from their positions on this or that policy matter or business matter. Their identity ought to be caught up in the idea that they are willing to constantly in, absorb and integrate new data, new information, and then reassess things, both their analysis as well as the prescriptions based on it, and be willing to change. What you've got to be is constantly open to revisiting things. And that ought to be your identity, that you have the intellectual ability and confidence to be forever open. I think you get into real, real trouble when you when you shut down. So it's a mistake to put your identity in a policy position because circumstances can change. Now, that was the argument of Keynes, you know, when you know, someone said, but, 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 you know, Lord Keynes, you've changed your mind. He said, well, when the facts change, you know, what do you do? And I think we've got to be willing to to change our mind. Even Churchill said, uh, you know, appeasement can be the best policy. It depends. Right. So you can't go through life saying compromise is always bad. 
in every situation, you've got to you've got to look at it in the specifics, and then you've got to be willing to revisit it. And that ought to be that your identity ought to be to have the intellectual honesty and courage to do that, rather than to to get locked in. Uh, to get locked in is is a really dangerous place to be. Oh, this has been great. Um, so uh, tell the, I, I follow you on Twitter, Richard Haas, H-A-A-S-S on Twitter, which I uh, I love your tweets. You're fun and irreverent. Uh, any other place people should find you on the interwebs? I have no idea. Probably much of it's pretty nasty, if you can, given how I'm often treated in the uh, public space. No, I, uh, I write a, a monthly column for something called Project Syndicate. I write regularly for Foreign Affairs, our uh, magazine. I'll, I appear on uh, Morning Joe probably about once a week. So, you know, I'm not in the witness protection program. <laughs> uh, my ideas are, are out there. This is an important time we're living in. I actually feel this is one of those times where I actually feel we're living in history and domestically and internationally. I feel that big, big, big things are afoot. So I think this is a this is a time for people to be engaged in these kinds of conversations, to be engaged in the public space, because, uh, again, coming back to what we we're just talking about, you know, assumptions that somehow the future would be better than the past, that things will always work out. I don't think anybody ought to be sanguine about those uh, those assumptions. This is this is a time to to be involved. Awesome. Well, thank thank you, Richard, for for joining us. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks. It's been great. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed the show, consider leaving a review. For more World of Das, and that's D-A-A-S, Das, you could subscribe right here on our YouTube channel, or you could find me on Twitter at Oren, A-U-R-E-N, Oren. I'd love to hear from you.